Um, to start off with a nice picture of Anne with her, her favorite animals, her mice. Um, I've been given an, it, pretty much an impossible task <laughs> to summarize um, Anne's contributions in 15 minutes. It's, it's totally ludicrous, but uh, never mind. Um, and of course, Sarah and, and, and Azim have already um, introduced um, uh, some of her, her many contributions. Um, and. Uh, um, so this is just going to be touching on various points and then I'll try and give a little bit of an overview. It's not going to be a very long talk, but just to, just to highlight some of the, some of the things. Um, so clearly Anne's, Anne's contributions to germ cell biology are, are very far reaching. Um, uh, they range from her ideas about the establishment of the germline, which uh, um, Azim has, has uh, discussed, uh, articulated very succinctly already in 1981 in, in, in her book uh, called Germ Cells and Soma, um, to her work on the origins of germ cells in early gastrulation, the, the factors affecting their survival and migration to the um, developing gonads, the genital ridges, um, work on, I'll touch upon this in a bit, uh, work on germ cell sex, um, things like X chromosome reactivation. Um, she also explored the role, of course, of, of somatic cells in order to identify the um, molecular players that, that interact, that, uh, that allow, um, that help direct um, what the germ cells are doing, in particular, whether they enter meiosis um, or not. Um, uh, to study, she also worked on um, the impact of genomic imprinting um, on uh, derivation and development potential of embryonic germ cells. Uh, she did a lot of that work with, with Asim. Um, she had, as, as we mentioned, this sort of abiding interest in everything to do with fertility and infer infertility, um, and that went well outside lab work. Um, it, People may know that she worked for, for the WHO um, for a long while on um, mechanisms of contraception and, and, and other things to trying to, um, um, actually her, her whole life really is trying to help people have children when they wanted to have children. Um, let's go to the next slide, uh, if I can. So um, this is a, a a diagram from one of Mitsunori Saitu's papers, which I think pretty much highlights everything that Anne did, because she was really interested in pretty much all of this whole pathway um, from fertilization to the production of, of mature gametes. Uh, she tended not to do so much work herself on, on um, final stages of urogenesis or somatogenesis, but she was certainly very, very interested in it and did, did publish some papers on, on both. Um, so where can, we, where can we go with this? Um, so as I um, as is mentioned by Azim and I've touched upon, she was um, interested very much in when the um, primordial germ cells first get specified, um, their migration to the developing gonads. Um, and then how they become different in, in the um, developing ovary in the developing testes. Um, so that was really whether or not um, they, they go into meiosis, um, enter meiosis early, which was um, basically Anne pushed this idea that um, what's defining a, a, a female germ cell is that it goes into meiosis early. And a, and a male germ cell that it, it doesn't, um, instead it goes into mitotic arrest and then resumes um, cell division and then only much, much later postnatally do you start having some of them um, enter meiosis. Um, she studied aspects of um, uh, sort of imprinting, DNA methylation, demethylation, et cetera, imprint erasures, the um, work showing that um, 
Uh, in fact, when I joined Anne's unit at the Mammalian Development Unit um, way back in 1982, so I worked with Anne for about six years there. She was working with, um, I guess, with Marilyn Monk, um, looking at, um, uh, well, a number of things, but one of them was um, uh, X chromosome uh, reactivation. Um, this was, again, an interest that followed her throughout throughout um, and in fact one of her posthumous papers I think published in 2008 showed that uh, random X inactivation um, occurred in the, the germ cells coincident with that in the surrounding somatic cells at about seven and a half days and the um, uh, so um, she was she once she got interested in an idea she she never let it go um, she followed things um, she took she was keen on trying to incorporate new new methods. So um, uh, she would do things when it became tractable to do them. Um, that was an important lesson I learned. Um, in fact, when when I first joined Anne's unit, she was um, of course she she was always interested in in sex determination. She was pushing me to to work on sex determination, but I could always say, well, Anne, I'm really not sure it's quite right yet, quite right yet. But after four years, I gave in but partly because things were then tractable. And uh, um, uh, so I have Anne um, to owe not only to the pushing me that direction, um, but to being sensible about it and teaching me to be sensible about things. Um, where are we? Um, so the, um, Anne showed that the XX, um, uh, Gadal environment, um, so that's independent of the gender, is then important for the reactivation of the um, inactive X chromosome uh, between about 11 and a half and 13 and a half days. Um, but that the somatic cells are not required for X chromosome reactivation um, during the derivation of embryonic germ cells. So they also reactivate their inactive X, but that can be happen independently of their environment. Um, Anne was a great um, proponent um, of studies using chimeras. Um, and these were also relevant to her work on germ cells. Let me just see where we're going. Uh, for some reason, this keeps on stopping. Okay. This was just um, um, to illustrate. Well, first of all, as has already shown this, this was work done um, ages ago uh, by, by Anne together with uh, Marco Ginsburg showing that the origin of the germ cells with alkaline phosphatase staining. And as, as I said, you know, we have nine beautiful methods now um, that, that uh, can be used instead of alkaline phosphatase staining. Um, but the basic ob observations were already there. Um, Anne, of course, didn't make all the critical findings herself, but she always asked the right questions and encouraged others to provide the answers. Um, and the bottom of the slide illustrates some experiments that she and encouraged Patrick Tam to do, uh, which were fate mapping studies, which showed that germ cells come from the proximal epiblast, but they're only specified during early gastrulation. Uh, and that prior to gastrulation, any cell within the epiblast can give rise to germ cells um, or to extra embryonic mesoderm. So, um, so this is typical of Anne. She, she basically, um, didn't order Patrick to do this, but strongly encouraged Patrick to do this, who had the skills. Um, and um, uh, it also highlights, I mean, Anne, Anne was proud of this, proud of, uh, of Patrick's accomplishment. Uh, she never felt possessive about um, uh, results, but um, uh, was very, um, I, I guess, proud about them. Um, where am I next? Okay. So Anne was a great proponent of studies in chimeras. Um, she, again, she wrote a book um, with Nicola Dwaran about chimeras. Um, um, and uh, she was um, uh, using these um, in, in, in her career off and on. Um, and of course they were indeed relevant to her work on gem cells. So um, together with Paul Burgoyne, uh, using chimeras showed that uh, which was, I mean, really nice set of experiments showing that it, that the 
uh, testis determining gene had to act cell autonomously within the so-called supporting cell precursors. So these are the cells in the oligonad that uh, in an ovary would give rise to granulosa cells, follicle cells, in the testis to, to Sertoli cells. Um, up until that particular piece of research, it was not clear which cell types the, the, the gene would have to be active in. Um, this turned out to be very important in, in ruling out um, uh, previous candidates for uh, the tested determining gene and my own work in, in, um, in working on and eventually proving that SRY was indeed the tested determining gene. Um, together with Paul, they showed that it, the uh, Sertoli cells are exclusively XY, so that's why in a, when you mix XX and XY cells um, in a chimera, it's totally cells are exclusively XY, which meaning that it had to be acting so autonomously. But also that um, as few as about 25% of XY supporting cells in these mixed gonads were sufficient to give you, to give you a testis. Um, this also contributed to the ideas that germ cell differentiation is subject to the influence of somatic cells. So in the absence of germ cells, the um, the testes will form pretty well, actually. They're not completely normal, but they form quite well. Um, so uh, in, it's clear that uh, it's the sporting cell precursors that direct the fate of the, um, the germ cells, either to go into mitotic arrest or to go into meiotic arrest. Um, in the absence of, of germ cell developing ovary, the, the ovary begins to develop. You see some molecular changes that are typical of, of granulosa cells. Um, however, you can never, of course, make an ovary because you require oocytes for the granulosa, granulosa cells to organize around to make follicles. Um, so my, so, so my own work was um, depending on this. Now, uh, Anne um, had also worked on what happens when germ cells end up outside the gonad. And so this slide is not quite illustrating that yet, but anyway, and ended up outside the gonad, for example, in the adjacent mesonephros, where um, it was found that they enter meiosis and try to make oocytes independently of whether they're chromosomally female or male. This again reinforced her ideas that the main difference between the, the male and female pathways for germ cells are distinguished by whether they enter meiosis early or, or late. It also highlighted again how the germ cells are influenced by their somatic environment and suggested experiments that might allow the factors putting germ cells into meiosis or mitotic arrest might be identified. And that led to a series of in vitro chimera experiments essentially where she was disaggregating and re-aggregating gonadal cells from different sexes from different stages and, and or with, uh, with cells from various somatic tissues. Um, and uh, um, it was clear from, from, from all this work that there were signals that were required to um, put the germ cells um, into meiosis. And um, uh, others, including the lab of uh, former postdoc, Peter Koopman, went on to show that retinoic acid signaling is probably a critical factor, although some new question marks on that, which I haven't quite got my hand, my, my, my brain around yet. Sorry, going backwards. But I just want to note that it's these types of in vitro re-aggregation experiments that, that Anne established that have turned out to be critical for the subsequent attempts to derive gametes in vitro from, um, pro -pro from primordial germ cell-like cells derived from IPS cells, for example, which as in Sarani has, has already mentioned. Again, this is from Michin Norisaitu. It, it seems that you, to really get um, germ cells to, or primordial, primordial germ cell-like cells to efficiently go um, uh, along either the, um, pathway to make oocytes or the pathway to make, um, uh, eventually make sperm, they have to be influenced by the surrounding um, somatic cells in, of the gonad. And so this has led to all sorts of attempts to, to um, have um, gonadal type um, organoids 
to uh, derive, um, also to derive gonadal, other gonadal cell types apart from the germ cells from pluripotent stem cells. Uh, my own lab and other labs are now working hard on, on trying to do that, uh, useful for many, many reasons, but uh, one of them being the aim that you could perhaps drive all the relevant cell types you need um, from your pluripotent stem cells, iPS cells or whatever, and then um, use those to be able to, in probably quite complex organ cultural system, systems, take the germ cells um, all the way through to either mature oocytes or um, at least um, spermatid stages of spermatogenesis. Um, where next? I'm, I'm not going to say much more about um, specific contributions, just that um, Anne, of course, made many, many contributions to other aspects of embryo development. And, um, but these are all relevant to her subsequent studies about, about germ cells and a lot of what all of us do these days. So, um, of course, there was Anne's early demonstration that pre-implantation mouse embryos can be taken out of the reproductive tract, uh, grown in vitro, subsequently used to produce live mice after the transfer of the cultured embryos to the reproductive tract or pseudo-pregnant female mice. In conjunction with um, in vitro fertilization, this work paved the way to the technological capacity of embryo manipulation. Um, the outcome of an extensive series of studies on superovulation, embryo culture, transfer experiments had actually profound implication for enhancing research in early embryo development, the role of specific genes, um, and of course, for the application of, of assisted reproductive technologies in agriculture and medicine. So Anne's scientific achievements were, were truly outstanding. Um, she was able to see through the, the fog and ask critical questions at the right time to understand the long-term value of working on difficult problems, to recognize the importance of an une unexpected result um, and to worry about the details. Even this occasionally meant carrying out what many of us, many of today's students might consider rather tedious work like counting cells, um, many, many cells. Through these approaches, whether adopted by herself or encouraged in others around her, Anne had an enormous positive impact and an enduring influence across many disciplines and not just germ cell biology. Um, I can't help thinking how, Anne, how excited Anne would have been about all the new methods that we now have, for example, for single cell analysis, to look at gene expression, uh, chromatin states, enhancers, uh, epigenetic marks, and so on. Um, and I think she would have been truly delighted about the progress of driving gametes in vitro. Um, you know, her last paper uh, published in 2009, two years after her death, was, was on that very topic. Um, clearly, I, I would need much longer than 15 minutes to convey all the work Anne did and its amazing legacy, uh, but also her character and her sense of fun. Um, she would have truly enjoyed all the debates we're now having about um, the possibility of heritable, current heritable human genome editing, she would have had a lot to say about that. I think she would have said that uh, doing this in germ cells would, have, would be the best way forward. Um, uh, uh, it, it, we had some discussion about that earlier, we can carry on with that, but it's, it's, uh, I think probably it's the, the easiest way of doing it if you can um, have, have uh, normal germ cell development in, in vitro. Um, I should just point out that, that I found this photo of Anne, which I really like. Um, when I was staying at the Royal Society's Chichley House um, about, what, a year and a half ago, um, I was actually allocated a bedroom where this, this photo of Anne was uh, above the bed. So I had to sleep with Anne looking at me all night. Um, for those who, who know Anne, uh, she could be very charming. She was often very charming, but she could also... Uh, if she thought you were doing something wrong, give you the sort of um, look that made you um, tremble, almost. Uh, luckily, this photo is not that look, um, so I slept quite soundly. Um, but Anne was uh, um, uh, such an interesting character and a fabulous scientist. So um, I'm going to stop there. Um, as I say, Anne's contributions were, were way too many to, to go over in 15 minutes. Thank you.